Yeah, so the female athlete one day, the light course is where I take you through the principles of what goes on. And then um, we use experiential learning to apply it to things like external pelvic floor palpation, uh, squats, impact loaded exercise, including running and loaded exercises like uh, deadlifting, as well as lunges and step ups. So, um, you know, utilizing the principles that I teach to um, apply it, not just to people with pelvic health conditions, it's called the female athlete. So we do include some discussion about pelvic floor, uh, pelvic health issues, such as pelvic organ prolapse, stress urinary incontinence, antenatal, postnatal diastasis. But, um, you know, we can even touch on pain if people want. But honestly, these principles apply to all of your clients. So for the males that are listening to this video, um, you know, we have lots and lots that apply to all the people that you see, both men and women. And the reason why is because 50% 50, 50 of the population are women. And so if you see these people, you will need to know how to help these people. And we've got evidence that musculoskeletal conditions outside of the pelvis can be affecting their pelvic health and vice versa. So I think to really do a good job of um, helping people to be thorough and to be as holistic as possible, being aware of some of the simple pelvic health things that you can do as a non-internal pelvic health practitioner, like I am, I don't do internal examinations. Um, you can help so many more women than you, you could even perceive. Like lots of people think, oh, I didn't realize that it could be as simple as that. And yes, it can be. And working together with other pelvic health practitioners is really fun as well. I love collaboration. Can you um, talk about the external palpation of the pelvic floor? Because I think there's still a little bit of a barrier in people who don't necessarily want to be pelvic therapists with addressing the external pelvic floor. So what does that mean to you? And how would you go about that and making sure the therapist and the person, the athlete was still comfortable? Yep. So you get to see consent explained very clearly and carefully. Uh, everybody stays closed. I do all of my assessments with all of their clothes on, uh, whether they're wearing tights, um, you know, it doesn't matter. They could be wearing jeans, you could still do the assessment. Um, and so then it's just gaining information from the perineum, both uh, lateral, para, para, uh, paracentral, so just off the midline, as well as a whole hand broad surface palpation if the person wants. And using that information, you can teach people you don't even have to feel it yourself if you don't want to palpate. You can get the person to put their hand there, whether they're male or female. The principles are the same. And you can teach them how to self-assess for themselves while they're doing activities, you know, practicing at home in private and all the rest of it, uh, so that they can help themselves on their public health journey. That, that's really helpful because I do think that there's a little bit of a barrier for some therapists and um, fitness professionals. So I think that really helps clear it up that it, they'll be comfortable with what they're going to do as well as the person who's participating. Now, yeah, I, well, just on that, sorry, Ruth, if yeah, you're going uh, to do any, if you have ever uh, done a treatment for somebody with tailbone pain, coccydinia, then the palpation is, it doesn't have to be too much more extreme than that. If you've ever worked on, uh, let's just say there's a soccer player, male or female soccer player, and you've had to work on an insertional adductor strain, the palpation is about a quarter of an inch more medial to that. Like it's not, it's not very different to what we do already as uh, orthopedic and sports physios, physical therapists. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Because those of us that are pelvic trained that do internal work, we don't have those barriers, but we know a lot of people um, will do. So that's fantastic. Um, one of the questions is, what type, who should attend the course for the female athletes specifically? I think one of the best, the best courses that we have are people who are public health, physical therapists, people who are fitness professionals. So they're not even physical therapists and other professions like occupational therapists. We've had chiropractors, osteopaths, massage therapists. Um, so allied health, uh, fitness and wellness professionals as well as, um, in particular, orthopedic and sports physical therapists. I think if we can bridge this gap and I can have all three types of people in the same room, like we do get on the courses, people begin to realize that their skills in their particular area are really complementary and work well together with people of other skills. And quite often, there's not enough collaboration between all of these different providers and how they can benefit their client the most. So 
I think that there's way too much work for all the existing practitioners that are out there. So instead of fighting over the ones that currently attend, I think by working together, we can actually grow all of our businesses. So whether you're a, a health professional, a fitness professional, or a wellness professional. So I think all of those people should come. And so I say to people, if you see anybody who is a female, you should come along. If you only see male pelvic health, I don't talk specifically about male pelvic health, but the principles that I teach through the first part of the course, as well as the external palpation, the squats, the running and impact loading, jumping exercises, the lunges, the step ups, and the deadlift, the loaded exercises, all of that will apply because it's the same. You know, people say, oh, can you run a male pelvic health one? It's like, yeah, it's the same course. I just use different words. It's the same thing. You do the same thing. There's nothing special uh, about, you know, a deadlift that's different for a man than it is for a woman. So um, the principles are all there. And the female athlete course just has more of a focus on the female specific anatomy things and conditions. Now, do you discuss the return to running and impact after having had a baby in that initial postpartum? Yes, we do. We do discuss that. Um, we don't spend tons of time on it because it's fairly simple. It's an individualized program. And some people are ready to run at three weeks postpartum. There's not very many people that are ready to run, but there are people that are ready to run then. And then there are people that are not ready to run for three years. You know what I mean? So um, it's not a time based approach. Uh, and I do do different webinars about the details of things like that. Um, but we certainly See, no. use the principles. Yeah, we use the principles uh that i teach on the course to be able to help you determine where somebody's at uh so that they can you can help progress them as they're ready to progress because circumstances change all the time anybody who's worked in the first year postpartum with somebody will know that yeah you think you've got something planned out and then something happens and then you just got to check your plans out the window because the whole situation's changed so yeah. yeah, I think that would be really helpful because my experience here is that people get told as soon as they get to their six week point, they can return to all activity. And we all know that based on research and experience, that that's not true. So having a guideline on how to evaluate the person and let them know what they have to do to get back to those sports and things will be really helpful. Yeah. yeah. Um, good. So while we're talking about return to full activity, let's change track to the diastasis done differently. <clears throat> so talk about that. What is that day going to entail? Yeah, the diastasis done differently course is interesting um, because it's it's a bit of a hybrid course. Uh, uh, both of the courses are a bit of a hybrid course. They've got some online learning components that you do before you turn up. It's about an hour and a half for each course. There's an hour and a half offline that you do um, just, you know, listening to a lecture and things like that. But that one is focused on diastasis rectus abdominis. It is focused on women and postpartum women, but the principles, again, apply to those who haven't been pregnant before, as well as men and children. It's the same principles. So um, that one's really interesting because I take you through uh, not just the principles, but uh, you, you get to go through a consult on the day and you get to see what a consult like that looks like and an assessment process. And then I teach you the assessment process that I use. And then I give you the complete program, the template that I use on how I prescribe exercise for people with diastasis. And I'll let you in on a secret now. It's pretty much the same template that I use for everybody because you just adjust it for what that person needs. So if they've got a shoulder problem, I gave you know three people the same program yesterday. One of them had a back injury. One of them had a shoulder problem and the other one had an ankle problem. And they got the same template which the specific exercises look a bit different. So, um, you know, I give you all of that. And obviously I show you how it is uh, applicable to those with diastasis. You get the exercise links to the um, uh, demonstration videos for all the exercises. It's, it's, a, it's a more specific course where we spend the whole day looking uh, at not just the principles, but the principles in action in a consult, and then the the specific assessment process and the specific management strategies that you can use. So um, it's a bit more of a deep dive on a particular topic, but it's a great complement to the female athlete course because in the female athlete course, uh, we do impact loaded exercise and uh, you know loaded exercise through, through weights, through deadlifts, um, and we look at squats, whereas uh, for the diastasis done differently, we look at it through the uh, abdominal and trunk exercises and uh, more upper body exercises as well. So it's a great complement to each other, which is why running them back to back like that is actually a really fun way of doing it. 
and then the um having the female athlete course as as the basis for learning experientially we do the deep dive on the diastasis topic and in the future i'd love to be able to do i don't know back pain or shoulders or something and it would be a very similar type of thing you, you get the baseline done and we do the deep dive on the topic and and how that looks and applies in their thinking and their knowledge and their assessment and their management so in your opinion you think taking both days together would be much more beneficial than just doing one day at a time which i'm assuming 100 percent. this is why we set it up this way so that people would be able to get both in one opportunity for the weekend i just yep, knowing yep. i know if you work i think it's going to be invaluable um yeah. so the actual um course i know there's not a lot of sitting and didactic learning that's done ahead of time it's more experiential actually in the gym working with deadlifts and so on so tell me a little bit about that how that works yeah i you know physical therapists we tend to be very knowledge heavy we tend to want to know things we tend to want to know how to do it what sh what should we be doing and what what should people feel when they do it we want to know all of this and then with all of that biasing our interaction we go and then we try to feel what we're supposed to feel I flip it on its head and I, I tend to get people to do things they normally do, feel what they normally feel, and then ask questions around some of these, um, some of these principles and the experience of learning this way, it, it just sticks a lot better um, rather than trying to memorize things. If, if honestly, if memorizing content was a way to go, I'd just write a book and then sell it and um, I'd be done. But the thing is, is that it doesn't work that way. You can read a paper, but you don't know how to apply it necessarily. Even if you understand the paper, if if you don't have somebody to practice and and then see what happens with the twists and the turns. So yes, I get you up. I get you watching uh, on the diastasis done differently. You watch how I do a consult from start to finish. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know many people who put their own consults out there for public viewing. And, you know, people can criticize me if they want, like it's open for comment like most people don't like that as soon as somebody's watching them do an assessment they get kind of weird about it right like i've got a whole class and potentially the world able to see me work with somebody so um, on the course you get to see that process and it's hard it's hard to teach everything that i do in a consult because it's the interaction it's the how do i respond to this it's the not asking questions that i want to ask it's when do i ask the questions how do i ask the questions what's my tone like what's my volume like Am I directive? Am I led by them more in this particular instance? Or or do I have to direct things? What type of cues do I use? How do I choose to do all of that? I can't teach you all of that in a one hour consult. Like you get to watch it happen and you get to ask questions about it later. But all of those things are a part of the course. So, you know, the experience of watching a consult um, unfold in front of you is also one that doesn't happen very much at all. Um, uh, on courses so I think it's it's a bit special that way too yeah I would agree I think it's going to be really great that way um one thought I had is what if somebody doesn't do any weight training I mean I, lo I love to lift weights um that's my background I've got no fast fibers at all I'm all slow twitch power um so um what if I don't if I'm someone that doesn't want to do any weightlifting during the course how am I going to be able to experience the same thing Yep. Well, people have to lift things anyway in their everyday life. So you get to choose how much you want to lift, number one. Uh, number two, there's a lot of bodyweight exercise. Um, so there's bodyweight squats, there's bodyweight lunges, there's, we've got a little bit of a dance in, uh, in some of it. There's all these various ways that we use um, exercise and movement and activities so that it's applicable for everybody. You don't have to be a gym rat. You don't have to have lifted up a, a piece of equipment before um so all of it applies i apply the same principles to the very infirm all the way up to the elite athletes and um yeah it's it's going to be fun and we meet you where you're at and with my assistants helping to make it personalized for you you get a very um a very personal experience of what it feels like in your body that you can then take and use with the people that you see yeah i was just going to ask you what would be the biggest takeaway and i think you just answered it that they will have that ability to feel and um, and know what their own bodies are doing to be able to help others. So what what would you say is the biggest difference between this and any other courses that you've seen here in the US? I can't speak to every course that I've seen in the US. I know that my course 
um, the female athlete in particular, there, there wasn't anything like it when I started teaching variations of it from 2000 and, uh, 2012, 2013, I started teaching variations of this. So there wasn't anything like it. Um, you know, I was one of the few people that was talking about being able to do weights and impact exercise with pelvic floor issues like incontinence and prolapse. And I, I did cop a lot, a lot of issues because of that. Um, you know, people, people were saying, stay out of women's health. People were saying, you're a guy, what would you know? People were saying that I was damaging women. And thankfully, um, you know, thankfully some influential people could see that I was actually right. And I was evidence-based in my approach. And uh, the tide has changed in the last 10 years, thankfully. So it's been fun. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's nothing like it. The, the way I teach is different. The principles that I teach, um, I don't think they're unique, but I teach it in, in my way, which makes it unique. And I've spent, I would say that I've spent more in the last seven years, I spent probably more time and money thinking about how to educate than I have on how to do more physio things to put tools in toolboxes. You know, people are not machines, people are people. And so tools in toolboxes doesn't work for me anymore. Uh, before I used to think I've got to scramble to learn how to do all these techniques, but now it's like, okay, how does this person need my help? What can I do to help them on their journey? And it's not about selecting the right tool to fix them. It's about helping them understand what's going on and utilizing the scientific principles that we know of to help facilitate their journey. So it's a very, I've flipped the way that I've worked in the last decade up on its head. And it's been, it took me three years to, to really do that well. And it's an ongoing process because it needs to continue on. Like the day that I feel like I need, that I, I think I've got it all sorted is probably the day I need to retire. I won't be helpful then. So I, I love your name the, um, that you've got detective in your name because it really sounds like you're, you know, really getting to the nitty gritty of what's going on in the core. And um, and I just think that's so crucial because we, um, like you said, it's changed our practice in the last decade. Um, and I, <clears throat> I personally have seen, you know, a lot of change over the last 30 plus years in pelvic health. But I, I just love that you are looking at all of those details and able to share them with us here. So um, I'm super excited about it. I can't wait for you to be here. So, you know, I've watched a lot of your videos online. So what is going to be the biggest thing they're going to take on that they can utilize straight away without having to think about it? We know that people take away about 7% of a course that they, they take and immediately integrate that. So what is that 7% going to be? Yeah, well, that 7% is going to be different for each person. And I utilize educational strategies that I believe have been um you know shown in research to be more effective so you know different different strategies the experiential learning the whole um you know the whole kinesthetic visual auditory learning style has been debunked for 20 years now but people still persist with it and um you know so i teach in a multimodal way which has been shown to have the best results i teach with experiential learning and I teach using other strategies to help retention. So visual cues, auditory cues, repetition, uh, teaching each other. Like there's quite a number of things that are out there that I've uh, spent time thinking about my course and, you know, trying to make sure the learning experience is a really thoughtful one because the days are long. But by the end of the day, people are like, I can't believe it's this long. And I feel like it hasn't dragged at all. Like people are not falling asleep in the courses. Like, mm -hmm. they're like, oh my goodness, we got to go to dinner now. Like, <laughs> so yeah, it's fun. Tell me a little bit about your background. I know you're an Australian physio and you are a musculoskeletal specialist, which is the highest level of education in Australia for musculoskeletal treatment, right? And um, so tell me a little bit about your background there. I, I did the training for the musculoskeletal specialization, um, but I didn't complete the exam because they weren't ready for me and I wasn't ready for them. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a physical therapist. I, I like to say I work at the junction of uh, musculoskeletal or orthopedic sports injury and performance and uh, pelvic health. So I like to work at that junction there, incorporating all of those things. So I see the very young to the very old, the very elite down to the very debilitated and everybody in between for a range of different conditions. Uh, so I've been doing that for quite a while now. I started studying in 93 so 30 years ago over 30 years ago now i started studying and i've been working for myself since the year 1999 
and I worked in the public system as well as the private system. Uh, so yeah, I get the privilege of traveling around the world, teaching courses and teaching online and in person, um, as well as, you know, looking forward to going to Fort Myers for the first time. Okay. So how did you first start getting involved with public health treatment or education oh. rather than treatment first? Well, well, in terms of education, I got started because people were asking me about how I work with people with public health conditions. But I got started with working with people with public health conditions because um, in my very first year in the hospital system, so my very first year postgrad, I had to cover the antenatal clinic and the postnatal ward as part of my rotations. And, you know, I, I yeah, and so I, I got called down one day to the antenatal clinic and the lady couldn't move off the bed. And the... The midwife was stressed because she was running late on her appointments. The The woman was stressed because she had to go off and pick up her kids from school. Otherwise, she was going to get charged a penalty for a late pickup. And I was stressed because I was a new grad. And so I went down there and did, I always remember the, the golden rule, do no harm. So I did, this, this is very physio talk, but you know, lumbar mobilizations, grade one to two of the Maitland style. It's basically gentle rocking. And um, she, she, I said, oh, just see how you feel now after 30 seconds, you know, because that's a prescription that we were given, 30 to 60 seconds. And she got up and she ran out the door and the midwife was happy and she ran out, uh, she pushed me out the door and I was left standing in the corridor going, what just happened? I don't understand, but I obviously made a difference. And ever since then, I've been uh, wanting to help antenatal and postnatal people in particular because I just, I love that sort of thing. So that naturally leads to pelvic floor conditions and pelvic organ prolapse and birth trauma and pelvic pain. And then the thorax, because the thorax and the pelvis is the least well taught at university. So all of that combined with my sports experience, as well as my sports coaching, as well as my uh, sports performance work and the typical sports injury stuff that we do as physios and the musculoskeletal stuff. So spinal, as well as peripheral joints, um, and persistent pain and acute conditions, all of that combined, I could see common processes and principles that you could apply. And I use those same principles throughout all the different types of people that I see. So the, the principles are fairly simple. They fit on one slide. There's only eight points. But um, I, I think that I can cover pretty much most people using these principles. And then the details, right? So it's there's only eight points, but it goes very deep into what that means for people. Yeah, really, really interesting. So tell you mentioned sports coaching. So I, I do know a little bit that you're a crossfitter. You've also done some other sports, anything competitive, right? You're a competitive person. So golf, how does that work in there? <laughs> Just you know. Yeah, well, golf was because, you know, my, my, my dad wanted to play golf. And when I was uh, in university, I'd go and um, go to the driving range with him and would play golf. And every Christmas, you know, even even before they moved to Singapore for work. Uh, I was born and raised in Australia. And even like Christmas, he would want to go play golf at five o'clock in the morning. So I'd go along and then, you know, would play. So I was in high school doing that with him. So yeah, I got down to a handicap of 10. So that's A grade. And and I'm, I've been told that only 8% of people get to A grade. So I was pretty chuffed with that. Um, cool. And then, uh, yeah, so golf and golf performance, it's all the same principles. You just, the details go deep, but the principles are the same. So you can apply that to many other things as well. So um, other areas that you've worked in, I did read that you coached your daughter's netball team and some other coaching or training with rugby. So very eclectic sports, which I like. I don't know if anybody here in um, the local area knows what netball is, but um, but it's a fun sport. I have participated in that. I wasn't very good at it, but I did love it. Uh, is there anything you'd like to discuss about the research you talked about evidence-based practice and having different plans of how you look at patients but i understand that you've been involved in some research so can you expand on that a little um i'm not sure which research you mean um but i i've um i've looked at different things over the years i've i i like to stay as evidence informed as possible i i'm a fan of manual therapy i use manual therapy every day um, my master's, literally, my master degree says master in manual therapy, um, and I'm good at it. Like, I, I'm good at it. I don't do it when I'm overseas because I'm not licensed to do that overseas. So I don't do that when I'm overseas. But I love manual therapy. I think it's so important, and we get so much information from it. Um, 
and I change the reasons why I do something because a lot of what we the, the evidence suggests that everything we do for people seems to be better than doing nothing at all. Um, but there is no one thing that is better than the others. And I suspect if we look at the research and, and the results of different studies, you'll see that some people have a definite benefit, a significant benefit than most people in that study. And then others have a significant detriment and other people just have some benefit and some people have some note, you know, or some detriment. And in the end, it just kind of washes out. And what that says to me is that some people do really, really well and you'll hear it. Oh, you know, acupuncture has been the only thing that's been able to help me. Cool. Like I know on average that acupuncture doesn't do more on average than any other modality. But for that person, maybe that is important for them at that point in time. Maybe that is the thing that they respond to the best. And to me, it's not necessarily detrimental. Like it's not like I'm going to put an acupuncture needle in their, I don't know, in their metastasis or something. Do you know what I mean? Like we're still going to be healthy and uh, do no harm. You know, you're not going to try and needle the heart, for example. So, um, you know, I think being, being evidence informed and understanding what that looks like, not just on a population level or a group level or a gender level or a condition level, but on an individual basis, I think that's where I like to, to work through being able to keep all of those things in mind, instead of having different rules that I've got to try and follow. I hate protocols, not a fan of protocols because in physical therapy, honestly, there's very, very few things that are going to be, if you don't make a decision in the next 10 seconds, this person might die or not. I think protocols are very important in the emergency room. I think, you know, medical professionals have a much harder job that way. But in physical therapy, if I decide to give somebody an exercise that isn't the best for them, like I'm going to find out within a rep or two and say, you know what, maybe don't do that. It's not going to cost them their life, right? So um, I'm not a fan of protocols. I'm much more of a fan of meeting a person where they're at. And, um, you know, I think, I think that shows in the research too. Mm -hmm. I think I was um, interested in, there was a diastasis done differently project that you had um, collected some data with people around the world, right? And I was reading on some yeah. of that information. Uh, that's the diastasis project, the diastasis project. And so what I did was I've, I've got probably over 70 by now online consultations that I want to release to the world for free or for a donation, really. Um, so it's not a research project as much as it is an information project that I've self-funded, um, which I am always willing to take both monetary and time donations from people to help get this information out there. Um, and for the professionals, that's where the money from the diastasis done differently course goes to. It goes to help fund getting this information out there and um, being able to, to help people with diastasis not have so much fear. And, you know, the, the way that I work in my business is... Um, to grow exponentially instead of serial growth. So serial growth for me would be to try and have the same person increase the number of times they come see you per year. That is a serial growth type of way because you can only go so far before they cap out, right? Whereas if I see somebody say one to three times, but I do such a good job that they go tell everybody about it and I get, I don't know, three referrals, from each person that I affect that way, I'm going to be busy because people are going to be happy and tell me about that and tell them about that to their friends. And then they're going to send their friends. And there's just, you know, I haven't advertised in the longest time. It's well over a decade, well over a decade. I haven't advertised my services because people know about me and they find out about me and word of mouth is 80 plus percent of my referral source. So, you know, it's good fun. And yes, I work clinically 30 hours a week when I'm, when I'm at home and the other hours I spend doing the education work. So I work about 60 hours a week. <laughs> I was going to say, yes. And how long is that sustainable for? <laughs> oh, I've been doing it for a while. It's good. Um, the, it was the diocese done differently, that project that I saw, it really sparked my interest in the beginning um, when I started looking into what you offered. And I, I thought that's that amazing because I get questions all the time from therapists and um, traditional management for DR here is to just do head lift exercises, you know, in supine. And it's like, we've got to treat these people functionally. We've got to know when it's safe to bring them up into upright, which is basically their, their life. They are upright, right? We can't I was going to say they come in upright. They come in upright, so... Exactly. Yeah. 
So we got to address it. We can't just give them a exercise supine. So, um, so yeah, that was interesting. Will you be sharing any of the specific research with us that you've used to kind of guide your practice through the years? Yeah, that's in the pre-course stuff. So okay. that's all there. Good, good. Um, what else do you think we need to know before you come visit with us? Just know that I believe that you are an effective therapist, that you're an, you're effective at your job. I know that I'm speaking to, to your group. Um, so the physical group, I think that all of you are doing a great job. You help people, all of you, unless you're in your first week, all of you have had some sort of positive experience where people have gotten better. And I think that is because of you, not necessarily because of what you know, but because you have a great interaction with them, um, with what you know, as well as with the healing, the natural healing. And I think we have a really big and important role in that. So I think number one, if you tell me that you help somebody, I default believe it. And I just default believe that you're good at what you do. You're going to have to prove to me that you're not good at what you do instead of prove to me that you are. I just believe you are. That's number one. Number two, your results don't prove to me that you're good, right? They don't, sorry, your results don't prove to me the reasoning why you thought you helped somebody get better. Your results tell me that you're good. Like you, you can only come to the course if you can afford it. You can only afford it if you earn money. If you don't help people, you don't have a job, you can't afford to come to the course. So if you're on the course, I just believe you're good enough to be there because uh, you're helping people already. But your results don't prove the reasons why you were taught or the reasons why you think you helped them. And that's that's what my courses are about. They're about thinking differently. They're about learning differently. They're about assessing differently. And they're about managing differently. And I don't pretend it's a unique system. I'm sure lots of people are doing this around the world. But it's certainly a fun way to learn. I try to make my courses memorable. I have a secret desire for people to say, no, nah, Anthony's course is still the best course I've ever been on. Like, that's what I want people to walk away with. Whether it happens or not, it doesn't matter, to be honest. But I'm always striving to be better. And if that's what you're like, you're striving to do better, then you're definitely coming on the right course. Come on, both of them. You'll love the experiences I've got planned for you. Thank you. I know I've seen many of those reviews about your courses. So that's why I'm super excited about you coming. <laughs> I just can't say enough about it. So hopefully we will have a great weekend in March. Um, I've got one final question. Just thinking about how we are in the US with our insurance based model. And then there are some people that are working into a cash based model. <clears throat> Where do you think is the most likely place for us to be able to help um, female athletes maybe females males that are not wanting to get better from an injury what opportunities are there do you um here in the us for um us to have more of a hybrid type model where we are seeing similar things to in australia where people are valuing pt they're valuing physios and they're coming in for our expertise of being able to analyze their mm. movement I want to ask you if there are ways that we could integrate more hybrid system here with some of the knowledge that we'll be able to gain and mm. way of assessing athletes to utilize in a more of a hybrid type system where we are seen as the musculoskeletal expert that we can help them with returning to their normal or their, you know, sporting activities. Yeah. So there's a lot of layers in there and I have to kind of guess. So let me just clarify a few things. Uh, one thing that you said was athletes not wanting to get better. Um, I'm not sure you meant not wanting to get better. Uh, perhaps you mean athletes who want to get better, but the system is interfering with that um, and to help people more optimally get better. Is that what you mean? No, we see people who we, we get referrals for people who are sick we, for sick care, whereas we want to be known as, those that are involved in preventive care or in helping people with yeah. sporting activities rather than just in sick care, which is yeah, kind so of Yeah, people, so people, people always ask me, or people always say, oh, I didn't realize that you could help if I didn't have pain. And that's why I keep saying sports performance, not mm -hmm. just sports injuries, right? Or sports rehab. I do sports performance work too. I can help you achieve your goals, whether you have symptoms or not. Um, so rehab to me is getting you back to how you were before, uh, sports performance is improving where you are, whether you are injured or not sports performance to me is improving where you are from now moving forwards. And, you know, if you are injured, it's exceeding what you used to be like that to me is, is 
the goal of rehabilitation it's not just to get you back to how you were before but it's to either exceed where you were before or recognize the differences in your condition now and maximize your potential right now because like honestly if i take somebody who's had an amputation of their arm through trauma i'm not going to grow their arm back but that doesn't mean that they can't exceed what they used to be able to do or change and maximize their performance because they've lost part of their arm so to me being able to work not just in a sickness model but a wellness model and land on that continuum somewhere and drive that agenda you're asking me to solve a political problem in america which isn't going to be solved by me that's for sure so recognizing the constraints that we work in the access that physios have the standing that they have in the medical medical community influencing the medical community and the other stakeholders like insurance companies doing all of that will come from getting results and getting results will come from thinking differently learning differently, assessing differently and managing differently. Because at the end of the day, an insurance company wants to spend less money on their on their members seeking services. So if you can demonstrate that you can help somebody with less sessions, they're going to be happy with that. Um, now, the business managers might not be happy with that. But again, I tell you, if we get if we get a good reputation of helping people get better quickly, well, then not only are the insurance people happy, but the business managers get happy because we get more referrals. And then, you know, I, I can I can do a separate thing if you like. We just organize another seminar, but I can tell you how, you know, you can keep people in your system so that you can keep people in contact with your system. System being your practice, your clinic. Um, you know, we can do that. But at the end of the day, you've got to work with what you have. I understand the limitations of the insurance model. I understand that it's a pain in the ass. I understand why people do cash pay, but it's also hard. I understand that not everybody has the money to do cash pay and people want to maximize the health benefits that they do have with their current uh, health benefits. So, you know, it's, it's a delicate balance for all of that. And at the end of the day, results speak the most. If you help your clients achieve their goals, if all the stakeholders achieve their goals, including medical providers, as in, hey, this person no longer complains to me all the time about their issues because I sent them to Anthony, they're going to be happy and refer more people to me. And, you know, your business managers and your bosses, they're going to be happy because you're busy and productive. Results at the end of the day are what speaks the loudest and doing the course will help you get results. Perfect. Perfect. I totally agree. So one person will tell 10 friends that they got better if you treated them well, treated them kindly, got them better, taught them how to manage things afterwards and didn't leave them dependent on you for the rest of their life. So, so yeah, absolutely. Agree. It's like a great restaurant, right, Ruth? Like if you have, if you have good food, it doesn't have to be the best, but if you have good food in a, in a good environment with good people around you and good service, then you're gonna have a great experience. You know, you could have the best food on earth and have terrible service, terrible price for that service um, and a terrible experience, even though it's the best food on earth, you're probably, it's not gonna be as good as something a little bit less lower in quality, but a much more well-rounded overall experience. And I think all of us are capable of providing that, that experience. We just have to be thoughtful in the way that we do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. I don't think I have any other questions. I'm just looking forward to you being here and um, we'll talk with our, I encourage people to come and sign up. Now, um, let me ask you one question about signing up. How do they sign up to come to the course? Do they have to sign up for both days? What happens if they want to just come to one day? Yep, so you go to the website, myptteducation.com. You uh, will see it on the top banner there and you just choose the options that you want. Uh, when you sign up for one, it will ask you if you want to sign up for the other. So uh, decide, and there's there's benefits. So you're going to save the most amount of money if you come to both courses. Um, but if for whatever reason, and there's no judgment, you don't want to come to one or the other, that's okay, you just sign up for that course. Um, it's going to be in your course calendar. There's going to be links that, uh, that you'll be able to provide people, Ruth. So um, yeah, it should be exciting, and I'm really, really looking forward to... Um, to having the opportunity to present this in Fort Myers. Well, thank you, we appreciate you coming. Thanks.